Good morning. I'm coming to you from beautiful Moranacook Lake, which is located in Reedfield, Maine, and is the site of our summer home. And here you see the beautiful lake, which is a, uh, a lake that is very large in size. And we are in this cove, as you can see. And it really is spectacular in the fall when all of these trees change. It's not really very uh, apparent in this video, but these trees here, some of them are over 100 feet tall. And here you see a view of the shoreline. And in the background, is our summer home and as we go down here you will also see the view of our pontoon boat magic and it's named after my beloved wife magic after 60 years it truly is magic And as I'm coming to you today, I have a very special subject entitled The Three Deadly Sins. And really before I get into that, I want to talk about something else, which is the origins of the Caprini score. And as you know, I talk about this many times and I refer to the fact that although my name is associated with it, it's due to the efforts of a lot of bright people. Beginning with the nurses and the PhD that suggested originally that I put together a schema of a, or a list of risk factors for blood clots, which we did. And then uh, I would say a year or two later, we're starting to use those, that list and <clears throat> I was sitting with my uh, brilliant PhD, uh, Lachman Segel, who I had the good fortune to work with for a number of years, and he was uh, the inventor of one of the artificial bloods. And he said to me, you know, Joe, you keep talking about this list, and this isn't just a list of risk factors, but it's also the score is not just the sum total of the number of risk factors but it also calculates the weight of each risk factor. So let me give you an example. Let's talk about patient A. Patient A is 42 years old. That's a point in the Caprini score. Has a BMI of 29, which is over 25, so that's an additional point. And as a young lady taking birth control pills, that's an ad also an additional point. So, patient A has three risk factors and the score, Caprini score, is three points. Now let's talk about patient B. Patient B is 76 years old, so over 75 years is three points. Has a past history of a DVT, which is three more points, and has a past history of cancer, successfully treated. So that's two points. So patient B also has three risk factors. Age, cancer, history of DVT. But the Caprini score is eight. And that, that score of eight probably requires, according to the studies, a month of prophylaxis after surgery, even if a simple surgical procedure is done. So, I just thought I'd put that out there because I think it's an important concept and it's an illustration of how people around me helped produce what we have today and one of the reasons why it's so successful is all these brilliant people from around the world have contributed to this effort. Now let's talk about what I wanted to address today. I was recently reading in a magazine a story about the medically ill. And 
The medically ill, according to this definition, were defined as patients over the age of 40 with an infectious process, with congestive heart failure, with inflammatory bowel disease, with COPD and cancer. And that bothered me to see that definition the way it was put forth because it's omitting three very critical risk factors. And I call them, and that's the title of this video, the three deadly sins. <clears throat> Excuse me. So first of all, let's talk about what they are. History of venous thromboembolism in the patient, family history of venous thromboembolism in the family, the blood relatives of the patient, and obstetrical complications. Now that's the trickiest to talk about. And I would like to point out that thanks to a brilliant neonatologist, Holly Cassell, she made sure that we added these factors to our risk score relative to obstetrical complications. So what's all of this, what's this all about? What are the clinical symptoms of these complications that fall under the category of antiphospholipid antibody syndrome? That's a mouthful, isn't it? So they include patients that have experienced the sadness of a stillborn infant or repeated unplanned abortions or premature birth with toxemia, elevated blood pressure, kidney problems, and so forth. And these are clinical symptoms of this, as we call it, APL syndrome. And what they indicate to us is the patient has an acquired blood clotting abnormality, which is like a reaction to one of the clotting proteins. So you might say it's almost like a, you know, a bee sting is an allergic reaction. Well, this is a reaction to the clotting proteins. And there are three different abnormalities that can occur. They're so-called lupus anticoagulant, antiphospholipid, anticardiolipin antibody, or beta-2 glycoprotein, all big words. But the sum total is that if you have a history of this in your patient, of the stillborns, of repeated unplanned abortions, of premature birth with toxemia, it pays to do these simple blood tests. Because if the patient is carrying these risk factors, then the patient's at very high risk of thrombosis. <clears throat> now, you might say, well, suppose we're talking about operating on a 60-year-old woman for cancer. Why do we have to talk about her obstetrical history? Well, because sometimes, sometimes what happens is the patient will have these abnormalities and be asymptomatic. And they carry them sometimes for life. Sometimes they get better, sometimes they don't get better. And sometimes they're carried for life. And as a result of that, they lie there dormant. But it's very important to know about them. Now, if the patient has three risk factors, three, all three abnormalities, then the score is three and their incidence of thrombosis is high. If just two abnormalities, then their score is two and one abnormality, the score is increased by one. But if that's the incidence of thrombosis, but the Caprini score is three for any of one or more of those, we just count three. And the reason we do that is because that increases the risk. As I, as I mentioned before, you may have a, a, uh, a 60 year old woman. Let's talk about that. 60 year old woman comes in for 
resection of a sigmoid cancer, sigmoid colon cancer. It's early, it's straightforward. She's going to be expected to make a full recovery. And so she's over 60, which is two points. She has cancer, which is two more points. She's having abdominal surgery, which is two more points. So that's a six. Moderately high, but not off the charts. Now she has an antiphospholipid, uh, anticardiolipin antibody of one or another. Now it goes up from six to nine. Now we're dealing with a statistically significantly elevated patient that's in the highest risk score in general surgery over eight is considered the highest risk score. And as a result of that, she probably will benefit from 30 days of prophylaxis. So let's talk about deadly sin number two. <clears throat> and this is a past history of blood clots in a patient, DVT or PE or both, or an ischemic stroke. These patients, as a result of this, are at increased risk of thrombosis. Now, how long have we known about this? Well, I'd like to now talk about genius occurring anywhere. And this particular genus, genius was Dr. Maxwell Boro, who was a general and vascular surgeon associated with Seton Hall, and he was chief of surgery at the Somerville, New Jersey Community Hospital. <clears throat> Excuse me. And in 1981 and in 1983, he published two important and enduring publications. And you know, oftentimes we poo-poo history, <clears throat> and oftentimes we say, oh, those are old studies, so they don't really, they don't apply today. Well, not true. He studied a group of a thousand patients, and these patients were all abdominal surgery or orthopedic surgery, and as a result of that, all the patients had fibrinogen scanning. Now, fibrinogen scanning, I'm getting a little cautious here because a speedboat is approaching behind me, and the waves that it puts forth, especially with the, with the water skier, sometimes are significant. So I have to head my bow into the waves and we'll go across. Okay, so these patients all had fibrinogen scans and the positive fibrinogen scans were verified with a venogram. Now a venogram is a very sensitive test for the presence of blood clots. We don't use it today very much. It's overly sensitive in certain cases, but it gives you the total number of patients in a group that have had a clot. And when you took a look at these patients, he found out that if a patient had an abdominal operation and had a past history of a blood clot, then the chance of another blood clot without prophylaxis was 66% so that there was a very high incidence of blood clots in patients with a history of venous thrombosis. And subsequently, many, many studies have confirmed the association of DVT history with uh, developing another blood clot if the patient is symptomatic. have to look around here again. We managed to run into this water skier and well, I'm heading over here out of the way. So a past history of venous thrombosis or pulmonary embolism is very, very important. Now let's come back to what started all of this, the definition of medically ill. Where in the definition of medical ill do they talk about the past history of venous thrombosis? It's a well-known entity and a well-known factor. 
And so it's important for you to understand in the public and when you're reading these accounts about medically ill that you make sure they talk about the deadly three. Past history of venous thromboembolism or ischemic stroke. Family history of thrombosis or and or obstetrical complications. Now I want to back up to obstetrical complications once because the only risk score I know of the modern risk scores, and believe me, there are many roads to Rome. Uh, you have to do the score that is most applicable to your particular hospital, your culture, your patient population, but no other score talks about obstetrical complications. So you always have to keep those in mind. Now let's go to the real big silent killer. Family history of thrombosis. I was just listening here for a moment. If we're lucky, we may hear the call of a loon because there are loons that live on this northern lake. Okay, so what is the story of family history of thrombosis? Well, you're all familiar with this. You all know in your families the diseases runs in families. Heart disease, stroke, hypertension, Parkinson's, many, many things. What about blood clots? Well, same thing is true of blood clots. And oftentimes, or many times, people are not asked about that. How many times have you seen a physician and they say, Anybody in your family have a blood clot or an ischemic stroke? That's not usually a pointed question. You usually ask, well, do you have any problems in your family's past? Yeah, everybody's fine. And you have to investigate that further. And so we found that, and especially at North Shore, where I worked for many years, it's been a very difficult task to get good information about family history, because it's often not asked. And you might understand that risk assessment is sometimes done at the wrong times by the wrong people. The only person that should do a risk assessment is the person trained to do a history and physical. Now, in addition to that, having the patient fill out a patient-friendly form ahead of time is very valuable because they can think about their past and their history and then when they get seen, when they have an emergency, when they need to come in for surgery, then it's possible for the person, again, that's responsible for the history and physical to go ahead and complete the score. The floor nurses are not appropriate for this. They have many, many duties, many things they have to fill out. They're not trained to do a specific history and physical. Now, on the other hand, a nurse practitioner or a physician assistant or a resident or an intern that's trained, wonderful. That's who should do it. There's two other places where I think it's inappropriate. One is in the surgeon's office. When you go to see a surgeon, especially if you go in for a cancer, you will often ask, what about this? Is the cancer curable? How long am I going to be out of work? How much pain am I going to be in? How much is this going to cost? Will I ever be the same? What happens if you have a bad day? That's no time to talk about Antilles stroke. But the person that works with that surgeon, who is trained to do an intake, history and physical intake observations, then it's perfect. Now the place that I've seen, which is most inappropriate, is waiting until the patient gets into the holding area. My goodness. When you get into the holding area, first of all, the nurses, what's your name, what's your date of birth, what surgery are you having, what patient part, who's your doctor, look at your labs, EKGs, laboratory work, do you have any allergies? And then the anesthesiologist will come in and talk about problems peculiar to the anesthetic, 
as a result of the ump cutting operation. Nobody's doing a history and physical at that time that's really worth it. Now, what we have found is that we have developed, again, lots of bright people around the world have developed six, seven different uh, languages, a patient-friendly risk assessment. And in this patient-friendly risk assessment, you can list all of these factors. And we also had a group of high school students take it out to their classmates to take home to their families. And of course, the families are interested in helping the students get a good mark. So they all huddled together. And in 1,200 responses we received, and we published this, 21% had a family history of thrombosis. So that's a good way to collect the data, and we're working on a phase two for that. But now let's get back to family history itself. A patient that has a family history of thrombosis, especially in a first degree relative, has twice the chance of developing a blood clot as someone without that history. Now, if the patient has multiple risk factors, let's say the lady I talked about, age, cancer, so forth, elevated BMI, um, swollen legs. Thought I just heard a loon. Under those circumstances, these patients would have up to a 60-fold chance of getting a clot compared to someone who didn't have any risk factors and had no family history. So family history is really critical, folks. So what, did I like, what I would like to leave you with is remember to do a good history and physical examination at the right time. Remember to always ask about these questions. If you're doing a simpler score or another score, um, improved D-dimer, Padua, Geneva, whatever, that's fine. But don't leave these factors out. And I want to say one more thing about family history. The only other risk assessment that specifically lists risk, family history is the Department of Health, National Health Institute of United Kingdom, which has, a, they have their own risk assessment, which is a good one. It's different than, uh, than mine, but it's a good risk assessment. And they track family history of thrombosis. And they also required mandatory implementation of this risk assessment in order to get paid. So you had to fill out the form and follow the recommendations or you didn't get paid. Well, over a two year period, there was a reduction in DVT, PE, and mortality. And I believe, they, well, I wanna say they saved 912 deaths in the United Kingdom over a two year period using this protocol. So, and remember, the other risk assessments that list thrombophilia, that is the wrong target. Well over 80% or more of patients who develop blood clots may have no identifiable factor in their blood that would indicate a clot. So most of the time it's not useful. The other thing is these tests are very costly and as a result of that, they're not often done and they have insurance uh, implications for getting insured if you're positive and so forth. So anyway, something to keep in mind. So overall, make sure you ask about the deadly three. Make sure you score your patients. And I hope you all have a great day and we'll see you again next time. Now, back to Marana Cook Lake. And on the far shore, you see houses, and this was a very popular destination in the 1950s and 1960s for tourists. They would come from all over and they would take the train. And the train would arrive at a place called Moranacook Station. And that uh, we see here in front of us is actually there's a trestle over a limb of the Moranacook Lake where these trains come. And just before that, down the road here a little bit, is Moranacook Station, 
where they would drop people off, then they would be taken by buses to the various camps in this area. So it, indeed, it's a beautiful area. I'd like to thank you all for your attention to this video, and we'll see you again next time. You never know when or where. Thank you very much.